Sir Patrick, your interest in astronomy began when your mother gave you a book at six years old about the solar system. Actually, it was the book in the bookshelf that I found, read by chance, and I was just rising at seven. The book's up there, behind the dragon on the mantelpiece. <laughs> How did that interest in astronomy progress to an interest in the exploration of space? Oh, they're all, they're all combined, you know. I mean, if you're interested upon Mars, we well, may, may or may not be some kind of life there. And the only certain way to find out is to go there. So I realised that at a very early age. You've actually written some science fiction yourself, but who were the people who, who were the science fiction authors that you read and who were the people that influenced you in your early years? Well, I wrote a series of children's books, they're up there, but no more than that. Uh, science fiction writers, well, some Arthur Clarke, of course, who became a lifelong friend of mine, whom I met at the VIS. And, uh, Olaf Stapleton was another. H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, most certainly. Mm. How did you first come to hear about the British Interplanetary Society and when did you actually come to join them? Well, I was a founder member. And um, there was a notice up, I think, in the, one of the local journals I happened to pick up. I so, thought, well, this sounds interesting. I know I'm very young. I may be young, too young to join, but I'll write to them and see. And I wasn't too young, so they let me in. At that time, I mean, in, in the pre-war period, did you actually get involved in any of their activities or go to any of their meetings? I all? went to their meetings, yes, I was able to do that. So I couldn't do much of the way of activity, but nobody could in those days. The UBIS was really in a talking point. And people in general regarded space travel as a music hall joke. And uh, it was only when the first satellites went up that they realised it wasn't. So I remember one of my very early meetings, Arthur Clarke was there. I think, was, I think I was 13, he was 17, four years different. But we, we struck up an immediate friendship that lasted all our lives. Who were the other members of the society that you recall? Leslie Shepard was one. He, he may have been a founder member, he was very near anyway. Leslie Shepard was one. He's been a mainstay of the BS for a long, long time. Len Carter, of course. Presumably you met Philip Cleeter. Yes, Phil Keith, I did indeed. Yeah, and A.M. Lowe um, in the post-war period. Yes, I did meet, I did meet Lowe, but I didn't know him well, but Phil Cleeter I did, I knew very well indeed. Philip Cleeter um, formed the BIS in Liverpool in 1933, so he came down to the meetings in London and organised meetings in London, didn't he? He did, but he never really received the, the recognition he deserved, I don't think. I mean, he was our founder. But he'd, um, he played a slightly lower, lo lower key once he moved on to London, which was a pity because without him the Bears wouldn't have, wouldn't have got going in the way it did. Mm. Who actually were these people? What were their backgrounds and who did they actually...? Generally scientists. I mean, the Doc Cleeter was an engineer, for example. Uh, and um, Len was a, was a businessman. But it, was, it came from all, all walks of life and at all ages. I was, I think, the youngest, but not by a lot. There were several very, very young members, but they've all died off. And I, I have a feeling, a nasty feeling, I may be the only original member now living. I don't know. The BIS's activities actually were suspended at the beginning of World War II. They had to. But, I mean, did um, members actually keep in contact still at that time? Yes, you still published, published the journal. Oh, right. And the BIS journal still went out to people, and we kept in contact that way. So there was nothing we could do experimentally. In fact, there never really was, you know. And <clears throat> I think, I must in all honesty say that I think we did miss a big opportunity. Because when the first satellites went up, and we should have formed a series of information points, and uh, get, kept people informed, and this wasn't unfortunately done. And I think we missed our chance there badly. The BIS reformed in 1945. It never disbanded. It was merely dormant. It got going again in 1944, 45, 46. And we've sort of briefly talked about the pre-war meetings, but in the meetings after the Second World War, where were they actually held and what were the activities that they actually Many of them were at Caxon Hall. We never had then a, a real central meeting place, as the RAS has, for example. It's a good pity we didn't. I've seen the name, the Mason's Arms in Maddox Street mentioned quite a yes, lot. Yes, over there. Yeah. I mean, did you go to those meetings? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
And and what actually happened at those meetings? Were they were there lectures? Were there talks? Well, were... But lectures, talks, and discussions. And quite a number of very good ideas were put forward by the BIS. Some of which have really come to pass. Because we couldn't do more than that. Were you actually involved in the lunar project? Because the BIS had this this lunar project, didn't they? Well, I was because I was a moon mapper, and um, I'm glad to say my maps maps of the moon were used both by the Americans and by the Russians. So I got involved in in, in that respect, not on the actual mechanics of it, but I, I knew nothing about that at all. As a, as a moon mapper, yes, I was involved. Because the, the BIS, they actually built this piece of hardware, the Curlier Stat. I don't know whether you ever saw that thing and saw it operating, did you? It, I didn't see it operating, but I, I would like to have done it. <laughs> I'm not sure it ever did. <laughs> Before World War II, um, basically, although there were people who believed that um, space travel was possible, there really wasn't any data to work on. Whereas um, after World War II, there was the data from the V2. Was there a sort of change in feeling about it? There was, but quite slow. As you say, the V2 uh, really was the start. Um, masterminded by Werner von Braun, who I came to know very odd. I mean, uh, there was a, he was building the rockets for Hitler at Peenemunde, and in 1943, the RAF bombed Peenemunde. I might have been on that raid. Actually, I wasn't, but I might have been. After the war, I got to know Vera von Brown quite well, and I must say, well, the only German I really liked. <laughs> um, you've already touched on this, but I mean, certainly in the pre-war period and after the, after the Second World War in the 40s and 50s, um, what was the general public's attitude to the people who were interested in this subject? It altered very quickly indeed, partly with the Sputnik 1 and when the first man went into space. Uh, the, uh, the popular uh, opinion swung right round. Before that, people who were members of the independent society were got us slightly mad. But the opinion changed very quickly after that. And we heard that space travel was possible and would come about. 1956, you became the first editor of Spaceflight. Um, what were the discussions and how did the BIS decide that it needed to publish a magazine like Spaceflight? Well, we didn't. We hadn't got much publicity. We wanted more members, and the journal was too technical for most people. So, why not found a, a popular magazine? In fact, I think it was my suggestion actually, and we did. And space radical still goes on. The actually up there is a, a copy of the cover, of the first space flight. And how long did you actually edit space flight for? Four or five years. At that time, what were the kind of articles that you were actually covering? What were the things you were discussing in? Well, in partly popular articles, partly speculation, and, and of course one or two technical articles. So it was, it was a grand mixture. To a certain extent, yes, it is, because the journal is the technical thing now for the BIS, and the, it's more of a pop, pop, popular journal, and people do read it and do, do like it. You started presenting The Sky at Night in 1957. Yes. Same year that Sputnik One became the first artificial. Be, artificial my first program just a few few weeks before, so I think we started before the space agencies. <laughs> that actually placed you in the absolutely perfect position to be an observer and and to you know be involved in the space program of the 1960s. I, this is probably one of those ridiculous questions, but what are the real highlights that you remember from those early years? Those early years, well, first of all, was the first man who went up, or the other, and then uh, the first pair of men who went up. Then, of course, we had the first um, unmanned rockets to the moon, and then the first man men round the moon, and then the first man on the moon. Of course, that settled it. There was no more, no more laughing after that. I mean, one of the things that always sort of strikes me is that for somebody like yourself, whose prime interest really was in observing the moon, to be able to see the far side of the moon for the first time because of space exploration, that must have been a wonderful moment. Well, particularly for me, because I was engaged in that. Because, uh, as you know, the moon tilts very slightly. We can see a little way around all turned edges. We call these the libration zones. And I spent 10 months mapping the libration zones and as well as I could with my telescope and others. And finally, of course, we got the first pictures from back there. And um, I, well, I wasn't far out because I couldn't get very far, but we had to wait then for the, 
the first main picture of the entire Mon Moon's Far Side, which was a Russian one. I seem to recall that you were sort of slightly privileged because the Russians wanted you to see the first pictures from the Far Side, is that correct? Uh, yes, it is in a way, but don't forget, um, the Cold War <coughs> didn't really affect us because um, uh, interplanetary flight is not a wartime thing. And uh, the BIS and the Russian society went on corresponding during the Cold War. Because once you come on the rockets, then of course it is a problem. But otherwise there wasn't. During your career, you've obviously met, you know, the real personalities who've been involved in astronomy and space exploration and the engineers and, you know, um, all these kind of people. I mean, who are the personalities that really stick out in your mind? I must be the only living person who's met the first man on the moon, the first man in space, and the first airman. I mean, all real writers when I was 17. And I mean, what were the circumstances of you, your meeting with, with Orville Wright? Well, at the start of the war, I fiddled my medal, I must admit, and I got into the Air Force. I was underage. And uh, I volunteered, I made a navigator. And a navigator training, we went first over to Canada, we had um, a few months training over there before we came back, started doing the real thing. And I was over there, and I had a, a week leave. I went down to New York. There was a little science meeting going on there, and I was invited. And there was Orville Wright. And there also was Einstein. So it was a great moment for me. And they were both at the same meeting? They were. Incredible. And of the astronauts that you met, who were the ones that sort of stick in your mind? I know all, all the moon men. Very well indeed. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, for example. Buzz was on, Buzz was on the other day. I believe that uh, Yuri Gagarin was quite an approachable character as well. He it? was. And um, I've met him several times. And um, I can't quite remember. But we could talk to each other. Now, I can't talk Russian. He didn't, didn't talk English. But I think we, got, we, we could both talk French, I think. But I could talk to him and say, my Russian is nil. <laughs> so you, I mean, effectively, you know, with Neil Armstrong especially, you were actually able to talk to him about the things that you'd been sort of writing about and dreaming about for, you know, your entire I did, life. I did a TV interview with him almost as soon as he came down from that first flight. I remember that very well. 20th of July, 1969, you're sitting in a, a studio with James Burke. Eagle lands on the moon. A couple of hours later, Neil Armstrong steps out onto the sea of tranquility. Can you try and recall the sort of emotions that you felt at that time? Uh, immense relief, because I don't think this was the first time it had happened. And although we were fairly certain the moon's surface was firm, we couldn't be quite sure there could be dangerous areas. That if you landed at a sharp angle or made a faulty landing, there you stayed. You couldn't get back. There was no return ticket. So when I heard Neil's voice coming through, the eagle has landed, I felt immense relief. And the second time, when they were ready to blast off back into orbit, and again, once I knew they were back in orbit, again, I felt tremendous relief. But don't forget, there was no safety measures at all. You know, this is something that you'd been dreaming about and writing about for, you know, almost your entire life. And it must yes. have been quite an emotional feeling to have seen that become a reality. It was. I could hardly believe it. <laughs> I think the thing that really, really struck me most was the... Uh, the first first flight into space at all by a man was no one was quite sure how a man would react. And of course, Gagarin was the first. And uh, was he going to be permanently space sick? Is he going? Was he going to be? We didn't know. So when he when he came down very happily, that was a great relief. We knew then that our dreams could come true. The robot probes have now explored virtually the entire solar system. How has our view of the solar system changed from the pre, um, pre-space age to now? Well, for most of the planets, we were fairly correct. Mercury we knew about, and of course the gas giants we knew. We've learned a tremendous lot about all of them, and of course only one space probe has ever gone past the two outer giants, Uranus and Neptune. So our knowledge has improved immensely, but only in the case of Venus were we completely wrong, because we just simply didn't know Venus was called the planet of mystery. You can't see through its atmosphere. And uh, was it carbon dioxide all the way through? Or was it? Some people thought not. 
It might be quite a pleasant place. Well, as soon as the first rockets went there and got close to range views, we knew that it was quite intolerable for any kind, any kind of light as we, as we know it. So we were off our list and the attention swung back to Mars, where we were much less incorrect. We got Mars wrong, wrong in several ways. I remember giving a, a lecture about Mars about three months before the first, first probe went there. I made a series of 12 eminent, 12, 12 profound lectures, all of which were backed up by the best authorities, and all of which turned out to be wrong. <laughs> because we thought the atmosphere was as much thicker as it actually is. How was the, the actual process of, ex, of um, exploring space differed from how you actually envisaged it back in the 40s and 50s? It didn't really. It went the way I, I thought it would. I didn't know how men, how men were going to react there. I was fairly sure that a robot probe was going to play a very great, great part, and of course they did. But if we're going to go to a place, you've got to find out what it's like. And that I knew, so from that perspective, I wasn't far out. Arthur Clarke called the 60s a golden age of space flight. Um, because there was so much happened, the first human beings going into space and the first moon landing and so on. I mean, I, I wonder if on the manned spaceflight side of things you feel any disappointment in what's happened since then because we don't have a base on the moon, we haven't um, sent crews to Mars. Yes, in a way I do, because there's a reason we could have gone far further than we have. And the reasons are twofold. One, of course, is money, and the other is the fact that um, Politicians don't agree, and I would like to take all the world leaders, put them into spacecraft, send off the whole lot on a one-way journey to Alpha Centauri. <laughs> so until we learn to work together, we're not going to get very, very far. We're quite lucky, because in a way, if you think of all the generations and all the centuries that we could have been born in, um, we were lucky enough to see the beginning of spaceflight and the exploration of the solar system. Um, do you think there is a danger that, you know, um, if we miss this window of opportunity, as it were, we're not going to get back into the... Well, we're certainly going through a danger period, because we, are, we know enough technology to destroy ourselves. I mean, one more atomic war bomb would do it, and we haven't got enough civilization not to do it. In some ways, we are less civilized than the Athens of Pericles, you know, and it may well be that every, every race on every planet go through this stage. Some will destroy themselves, some won't. I hope we'll be among those who survive, but the, it lies with ourselves see, to pick the right rulers, and we're not very good at doing that. America hasn't now got a way of getting crews into space. Russia is still using a spacecraft that was designed back in the early 1960s. China does have a um, manned space flight program, but it's yes, very, yeah. very slow and so on. Um, do you feel optimistic about space exploration? From the unmanned point of view, most certainly I do, and there's full cooperation there. Manned spaceflight, well, I think I have to wait for a few years, because if we, if we get proper collaboration between the various nations and put enough research into it, we could get a base on Mars, and that might, might, might be the start of even greater things. But in fact, no one can answer that question for the next 50 years or so. What do you think it actually needs to kick-start this process again? Well, the two kick-start episodes were the first satellite and the first man in space and the first man on the moon. And I think the next one is going to be a, a more, I would say, a more elaborate lunar base. And I'd rather have that than a space station, frankly. I would rather have a much more elaborate lunar base than put the space station on the back in the, in the list. Just going back to the BIS, um, you've continued to be involved with the BIS, you know, right since you joined in the, in the 1930s. How has your involvement with the BIS continued from that time? Well, so I'm simply, I'm, I'm, I'm a very ordinary member. I do get a space flight now, because I'm, I'm now at, I, in, in my 90th year, don't forget. And I, I've continued to be a member and take interest. That's all I can do. And in fact, it's very... The BIS can't do a lot more at the moment. Many of its ideas have been proved to be very sound, and they've been taken up. And that's as far as I can say. 
the last few years, I mean, the BIS has been through some quite serious problems. Um, do you think it can survive? I'm sure it can, and I'm sure it will. But there are bound to be hard times. And again, it comes down to money and politics. But I'm quite sure we will survive. And after all, it was there at the very start. I'm sure it'll be there when we... It's really uh, a going part of existence. And looking back over the last 70-odd years of the BIS's existence, what do you think it'll be... What are its achievements? What do you think it's, it's going to be remembered for? To spread knowledge. That's pretty easy. It couldn't carry out practical experiments, but it can spread knowledge and make space travel understood by people at large. I think it's done that very well. And the people no longer laugh at, laugh at space travel, and that's part of the work of the BIS. So we've been there all the time. We'll stay there. We'll go on doing what we can, and believe me, it's, it's quite a lot.